morning. Um, let's get started. Good morning, everybody uh, in the Americas. Good afternoon, all our friends and colleagues in Europe and around the world. My name is Jordan Spinter. I'm Deputy Consul General of the Netherlands uh, in New York, and it is an honor for me to kick off today's program. Um, let me start by offering a big thank you to our friends at the Danish Clean Tech Hub here in New York for coordinating this week's activities. Once again, I think Natalie Nolte from Clean Tech Hub is probably somewhere in the audience. Uh, thank you, Natalie. Great job once again. Um, for today's webinar, Recycling Unpacked, we have a number of uh, great speakers lined up for you. Um, and uh, as a Deputy Council General, of course, I'm here to learn as well. Uh, but I also want to share a little bit of my personal belief in the principle of circularity. Um, as a public servant, as a father, as a friend, as a neighbor, as a responsible citizen, I care, of course, about the future of my children. I care about my neighborhood. I care about my city. I care about the planet. And we all know that the linear, linear economy is not sustainable in the long run. So there is no alternative uh, for going circular. Um, and circularity actually touches on almost everything. If we just look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we can mention, mention SDG 6 uh, on energy, SDG 8 on economic growth, SDG 11, sustainable cities, SDG 12, sustainable consumption and production, SDG 13, climate change, SDG 14 on oceans, SDG 15 on life on land. Um, so that's at a very high abstract global level. We're going down from that global level to more the national level. Um, I'd like to mention a few things um, uh, regarding the Netherlands. The Netherlands has the ambition to have a 100% circular economy by the year 2050. Um, for those of you who don't know the Netherlands very well, um, I put it a little bit into perspective. The Netherlands is about twice the size of New Jersey, has a GDP about uh, the same as that of Florida, uh, and it has a population comparable to that of New York State. Um, so you can see how making that circular in 29 years from now is an ambitious goal. Uh, but as, as with everything, it has to go step by step, piece by piece. Um, and that is why the Dutch government has set specific targets uh, that have been identified and agreed on by multiple stakeholders. I'm going to mention a few small things. Um, one, there is a pact between government and the private sector to increase plastic recycling. Two, there is an initiative to use the residue um, from paper and carton manufacturing, um, which is like a glue-like material, and that can be used for the construction of new roads. Three, 75% of new mattresses must be made from recyclable, recyclable materials by the year 2025. That's in less than four years from now. The goal is to have an overall reduction of 50% in the use of raw materials by 2030, nine years from now. Um, and a final example, 70% uh, less aluminum cans in our economy by the year 2050. Um, that's for the Netherlands. Back to the US. Um, there's a lot of work to do in the United States. Um, Americans produce around 33% of the world's waste with 5% of the world population. Um, and it is not so difficult to see that big cities in the US have to be a part of the solution. Um, and New York City is the second largest city in the world uh, in terms of consumption after Tokyo. Um, so it makes sense to look at how New York's economy can become more circular. Uh, there is, for example, the New York City Zero Waste uh, Education Campaign by the New York City Department of Sanitation. There is also uh, the New York Circular City Initiative uh, that has recently produced a report called Complex Challenges, Circular Solutions. Uh, and according to that report, making New York City circular can actually create 11,000 jobs, deliver $11 billion uh, in economic benefits, and reduce waste to almost zero. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is there needs to be a value proposition. Um, 
And that is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so we're very grateful to have an expert panel uh, representing the whole spectrum uh, of professionals from many chip, many uh, steps in the value chain. Um, and then now it is my pleasure to introduce to you today's moderator, Elizabeth Balkon. Elizabeth is the director in North America for the Reloop platform. Uh, and Reloop is an international nonprofit organization that brings together industry, government and NGOs who share a vision of a global circular economy. Elizabeth, over to you. Thank you, Jordan. And a huge thanks to uh, Metabolic for putting this together, uh, to the Clean Tech, the Danish Clean Tech Hub, and all the Circular City Week organizers, um, and the great panelists who are joining uh, me today. I'm really delighted to be part of this conversation. Um, at first, I'd like to share with you a little bit about Reloop, um, who we are, why we're here, uh, what we're doing, and, and sort of how we're doing it. Um, Reloop is an international NGO founded in Europe in 2015 that brings together stakeholders under a common vision of a system where resources remain resources. We are working at um, all sort of five different levels um, that are supporting the circular economy. Um, and what, sorry, could we just go back to the last slide? Thank you. Um, and really the sort of main reason why Reloop exists is because we have a fun sort of very central belief that the transition uh, to a circular economy and the acceleration of that transition, um, while innovation and voluntary initiatives are certainly important and to be praised, um, that, that really the circular economy demands um, effective and smart uh, government intervention through policy. So policy advocacy is a big part of what we do. Next slide, please. Reloop is focusing mostly on um, the system conditions that uh, we find are needed to achieve closed loop packaging. Um, so this includes design for circularity, um, material uh, high sort of mandated uh, recycle content, in, in, in packaging, um, appropriate collection, as well as um, separation, uh, both technology and system design, and the use and sort of appropriate regulation of um, economic instruments as needed um, to ensure that uh, collection can be maximized and quality um, is not compromised. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we unpack uh, the deposit return system as an example. Um, and finally, that there be um, robust measure protocol and reporting in place to ensure transparency and accountability. Um, and this is imperative both to track performance as well as to understand um, and ensure that all um, of, the, of the active um, actors are, are doing their part. Next slide, please. So Reloop, how we go about our work is using research, some that we are um, undertaking ourselves or, um, or, you know, or, or utilizing um, consultants like Metabolic to put together. And with that in our multi-stakeholder outreach, um, we're constantly engaging with uh, governments, industry, um, a variety of stakeholders to share our insights and facts and um, absolutely our examples from, from overseas. So I appreciated the, the comment made at the beginning about how far the US has to come. Um, we know from Europe that um, some things have been done that can be helpful. Some things have been done that we don't wanna replicate here. So those insights are really key. Um, we're also using precise and concise evidence-based information to provide that education to decision makers. And then, then finally, we're really trying to inspire um, innovation and a clear understanding of um, the solutions that are in front of us. Um, next slide, please. And finally, you know, as we start to dig in specifically to the opportunity of having um, a beverage container system, a deposit system in the US at a national level, um, I should pause and say that the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act um, will be introduced today. 
Um, and in it, there is a provision for a national bottle bill. Um, so we are at a crossroads right now where this is less and less a hypothetical or uh, purely um, discussion of fantasy and, and entering the realm of possibility um, in that we could have a, um, a deposit return system uh, that covers the entire US, um, which would have incredible impacts. Um, we see from Europe and from elsewhere around the world that effective best in class return systems um, return over easily can, can achieve a 90% um, collection rate for beverage containers. Um, so this is, not, again, this is not fantasy, this is reality in, in so many jurisdictions that have best in class, um, high performing modern deposit return systems. This analysis here is not national. That's something that we're doing right now, crunching the numbers, trying to identify if the national bottle bill goes through what that could look like in terms of greenhouse gas emissions avoided, um, tonnage diverted from landfill incinera and incineration. Um, the impacts will be massive, I can tell you that. Um, but here's just a snapshot of the analysis that Reloop has done within the five Northeast states that currently have bottle bills. Um, so you can see even just this regional snapshot um, that the GHG savings, potential savings are enormous. Um, if we are able to get to that 90% or more um, collection and return rate, litter reduction goes way down. Um, and incidentally, cities and towns all over um, the US are paying enormously for litter prevention um, and litter cleanup. It's not a, a 1950s problem, it's a now problem. Um, and additionally, you can see the impact in terms of jobs, in terms of added revenue um, to cities and states that are so desperate uh, to recover from the impacts of COVID and the China national sword, um, as well as associated benefits um, socially. And, and I, I really like the opening remarks about, you know, we live in cities. These are places where we have our ch children um, and our families, and we want them to be um, places that are, are not only circular, but are offering quality of life. So with that, I think, you know, this is a little bit about Reloop and what we do. Um, in terms of maximizing circularity in US beverage packaging, which is the reason we're here today, we see that recycling is one of the earliest examples in the US of a circular practice. Um, and yet we're still facing so many obstacles to creating circular processes for packaging. Um, we see evidence of this across the supply chain um, from package design to the infrastructure required for collection, sortation and processing. Um, and the information infrastructure and technological specs that are required to achieve bottle to bottle or can to can closed loop recycling. I'm sure we'll hear from Peter and others about what that means. What are the quality requirements you need to get the recycled content into bottles, into cans and into glass bottles. Um, additionally, market conditions and commodity pricing play a huge role. They often, this often determines whether there's an economic incentive to use recycled content at all rather than virgin material. Um, and last but not least, we see the contours of our recycling systems and increasingly the policies shaping producer responsibilities, which vary dramatically from state to state and city to city. Um, I particularly like the statement from Metabolics uh, Recycling Unpacked report. Um, which says the urgency and benefits of moving toward a circular economy are clear. We need clean, stable secondary material streams that can compete with primary resource production. We need to keep those materials in circulation as long as possible at their highest and best use forever if we can. The key question is what actions do we need to take in order to make this transition happen? Uh, today, we will unpack some of this and more with the shared goal of a more circular system for packaging. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, let my, our wonderful panelists um, introduce themselves and say a little bit more about their work. Um, we'll start with James Souter, who is the sustainability consultant for Metabolic. The floor is yours, James. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. And I'll also add that as we go through these introductions and our, on our slides, please enter questions in the Q&A of the, of the chat here. We are very much looking forward to, to moderating uh, an engaging discussion after our introductions and our, and our initial questions. 
So hello everyone, my name is James Souter. I'm a sustainability consultant at Metabolic and I lead our work on circular products and services. My background is in industrial ecology and green design. And I've been working um, at Metabolic past four years, primarily on, on a lot of different uh, consumer facing product uh, innovation around circularity and also in the electronics uh, supply chain as well. I was also the lead author in this uh, Recycling Unpacked report that came out in the fall. And I'm looking forward to sharing a few of the high level insights from that report and our, and our, and our other research um, to guide this discussion moving forward. So we uh, go on to the next slide. About metabolic, uh, we're actually an ecosystem of organizations that are all united to under one unified uh, mission, which is to transition the global economy to a fundamentally sustainable and circular state. I work in the consultancy arm of this um, and we're based in Amsterdam, but we also have an institute and a uh, foundation software arm and ventures arm to help this mission move forward. We're really entering an unprecedented time in history. Last year, for the first time ever, the mass of man-made products outweighed the total mass of uh, what the earth naturally creates on itself, which is a wild statistic if you think about it. You know, all the different products that we have circulating outweighs all of the, all of the biomass and animals and humans that exist on the planet. At the same time, uh, on the next slide, the system that we are working under is primarily very linear. We extract resources, we use them fairly briefly, and then we throw them away. And less than 10% of the materials that pass through our economy are ultimately recycled. Moving on. At Metabolic, we think about the embodied impact of everything that we use uh, in our day-to-day -day life. Think about the time, the energy, the resources, water, and labor that go into producing our packaging, for example. Um, and this embodied value is really what we want to preserve in our recycling systems. And to increase circularity, this is something that we need to keep in mind as well as the offs of the upstream and downstream impacts of the products that we use every day. Go ahead. Uh, and the successful recycling system should really um, look at ways to preserve this embodied value, number one, but also create a really strong and reliable source of materials that can ultimately compete with primary resource production. You know, the ultimate goal isn't necessarily just to recycle more, it's to eventually be able to turn off the tap on mining and on producing uh, virgin materials as much as possible. This is a snapshot from um, the material flow analysis we completed on the Recycling Unpacked report. And we can see a big gap, of course, is in collection. Over half of the materials that are entering our system are ultimately just going to uh, the disposal and aren't being collected either through bottle bills or through separate collection. Um, and it's also really important to track what's happening to the recycled materials once it does enter the system. Is it able to be going back into high quality more closed loop systems, or is it ultimately being used in other applications, which is useful, but it's also um, not going towards actually turning off the tap on, on, on mining and, and producing raw materials, which is um, something that we want to be moving towards as a society. Uh, because of this, we're also, you know, not only facing a waste management problem, we're facing a waste production problem. If we're treating all of our materials in our society as waste, then of course, um, if they're designed that way, then that's how we're going to treat them. Um, and we wanted to start thinking about our products as resource banks, something that can live on multiple cycles and map out pathways for recovering them at high value over multiple times. All right, next slide. This is also uh, uh, an important thing to note is that recycling is just one part of a full system that needs to work properly in order to shift towards a circular economy where both people and planet can ultimately thrive. I really like this uh, model because it's a combination of the uh, value hill, which is the underlying curve on, uh, with the nine R frameworks, which identify different pathways for reducing impact across a production system. And I really like this because you can identify different ways of achieving circularity and, and everyone is part of the conversation in order to achieve this ultimate goal. Um, and I really um, am grateful for having all, all these uh, representatives from across the value chain in this conversation today, because I think it helps bring different perspectives of the types of collaboration that's needed to achieve the circular system. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. In our report, we identified different tailored recommendations for each packaging type um, to achieve this circular, the maximum circular potential for each one. Um, aluminum cans do perform well in the current recycling system if they are able to be collected. Um, and so we need uh, to incentivize the collection of, of, of aluminum, um, of course, in order to keep the high recycled content that aluminum cans have. 
glass bottles, um, the high, highest circular potential for glass is actually really localized reuse systems. Think about you know, taking your bottle back to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the local store and having it refilled right away. It requires quite a bit of energy to both produce the bottle and to transport it long distances. So coming up with uh, logistics that are able to incentivize localized glass reuse is, is uh, a really high potential for glass. And PET uh, bottles, um, in the long term, we need to start looking at uh, opportunities to bypass some of the, the difficulties PET has with the mechanical recycling process. So there's a lot of emerging chemical recycling technologies, and we need to think about what the energy impact is of these uh, opportunities to keep PET circulating at a high value without um, losing quality over the multiple recycling chains. And of course, across all of these different uh, material types, the bottle deposit collection systems we see is the big way to overcome that big hurdle in collection. And of course, our other panelists can go into more deep dive into what that's looking like uh, on the day-to-day -day, uh, in, in our policy realm. So I wanna leave uh, with two frameworks that I think are, are useful to think about the circular economy as well. Um, the first is on the left, the donut economics model, where we're trying to meet the needs of humanity within the social foundation without exceeding the ecological ceiling or the planetary boundaries that we need to uh, ultimately live within this safe and just space for humanity. And the way that we um, measure this at Metabolic is through the seven pillars of the circular economy, where we look at multiple indicators to identify not only the material energy and water impacts of our production system, but how does that affect biodiversity? What are the impacts on the social well-being of people and the, the cultures around uh, the world, while also generating um, value beyond just financial means. Um, and so I'll leave those two frameworks with us as we uh, guide the discussion forward. And I'm looking forward to uh, engaging with everyone on, on these topics. Great, thank you so much, James. Um, next, we have Kate Bailey, Policy and Research Director for EcoCycle. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we go on to the next slide. I am proud to represent EcoCycle as the recycling operator on this panel. So we are in the hands-on business of making recycling work each and every day out here in Boulder, Colorado. We are proud to have started one of the first 20 curbside recycling programs in the US. So back in 1976, collecting newspapers and aluminum cans. And we have been in the recycling business ever since. So 45 years has given us lots of experience on what works on the ground. Uh, and where we need some larger systemic changes. So all my remarks today come uh, with a backdrop of 65 folks uh, who work in all aspects of recycling. Uh, so next slide, please. We are a nonprofit recycler, which makes us a little bit different uh, than most of the industry. Um, so we're really focused on what is the mission of recycling? What is our goal? Where does recycling fit in how we move to a circular economy? And our programs and experience focus in four key areas. First is infrastructure. So we run trucks, we pick up recycling, compost, hard to recycle materials. So we know those ins and outs of hauling. We run the Boulder County Recycling Center, the MRF. Um, so we're processing 60,000 tons of cardboard, aluminum cans, bottles. We know the benefits of recycling. We also know the challenges of making it work, especially when it comes to plastics. We also operate a center for hard to recycle materials, or as we like to call it, the charm. And that's where we accept mattresses, uh, TVs, electronics, books, toilets, all sorts of you know, hard to recycle stuff that, that has a recycling market, but not, not in your curbside bin. Um, so this has really given us good experience in what it's like to create recycling markets and how, it, how, it, how can we drive participation and get these types of drop-off centers in every community. So really strong roots in infrastructure. All of those programs are supported. All that infrastructure is supported by really strong base in programs. So we are really rooted in the belief that Everyone in the community needs to be involved in moving towards zero waste. So we have programs for residents, businesses, schools, governments, events, advocacy and community engagement is the heart of what we do. Uh, we have long history of innovative education programs and as a result, some of the cleanest recyclables in the country. We also tailor all of that with policies. So 
policies both at the local and the state level. Uh, Boulder is uh, just the third city in the country to require recycling and composting at all residents, businesses, and apartments. So we're very proud of that approach. And we're increasingly vocal at the state and national level about what sorts of policies are needed to move with recycling. So next slide, please. So EcoCycle works in collaboration with other nonprofit recyclers as part of the Alliance of Mission-Based Recyclers, or AMBER. We really feel that we have a unique voice in the industry because first, we're grounded in this operational experience, right? We know what works day to day. Um, and then from that experience, we can talk about the policy changes that are needed, the infrastructure investments. But our view is really because we are nonprofits, we are centered on what's best for recycling, not necessarily what's best for us as a business model, which is different than the typical uh, waste and recycling industries as a whole. So we are very upfront where recycling is not the solution, where we need more reduction, uh, reuse, refill. Great to hear the Netherlands talk about reducing aluminum can consumption, not just you know recycling more cans. So we're uh, very, proactive in where recycling fits in the whole puzzle of the circular economy and then what are those policies practices needed to make recycling best in class when it is the right solution. So that is our background. I look forward to uh, talking with you more. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, on to Peter De Pasquale, who is the Vice President of Government Affairs for Nestle Waters North America. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's great to be with everybody today. It's great to be with such a good, good panel. Um, I'm already learning uh, quite a bit, and I'd love to pick your brain a little bit more, Kate, at, at some other time on, on your work. It's, 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 it's very inspiring, and I think it's a really interesting model. Uh, my name is uh, Peter De Pasquale. I lead Government and Regulatory Affairs for Nestle Waters North America. In that role, I'm the lead um, kind of policy representative of the organization before local, state, and, and federal policymakers. Also interacting, of course, with the broader stakeholder community that's in, engaged in this in this very important and exciting work. By way of background, Nestle Waters North America is one of the largest non-alcoholic beverage companies, you know, operating in the U.S. Um, we produce, sell, and distribute six regional uh, bottled water brands. Um, so in the, in the New York metro area, it's Poland Spring. And uh, across the country, it's brands like Ice Mountain, Zephyr Hills, Deer Park, uh, Arrowhead, and, and Ozarka. We also operate the, one of the nation's largest home and office uh, delivery, uh, bottled water delivery uh, companies with, with Ready Refresh. Um, I think this is an exciting time. I think this is a really exciting time and I'm hopeful. And uh, I, I truly believe that some of the, the organizational actions that we're all taking, whether it's a nonprofit or the private sector, combined with some of the thoughtful public policy that I think will come out of this era, um, will have a real future positive impact. Um, and, I, and I share very much kind of Jordan's sentiment at the outset a lot of us are doing this not only you know for for for, for our lives but for, for but for the next generation um, you know as a, as a company that's fully committed to the circular economy and and realizing circularity um, we internally think about this work in a, in a few different buckets I think the first place we, we think about is is source reduction um, that's you know using the amount of material that's solely necessary to you know protect the quality and um, the integrity of the product and no more. So for us, of course, that kind of uh, reflects itself in the light weighting of the product as well as the you know controlling the secondary packaging. That's very much what we call a source reduction initiative, which needs to be kind of on top of mind of all. Um, CPG companies right now. Kind of the next bucket is that design for recyclability, you know, ensuring that as, you know, your product development teams are developing products that go into commerce, that those products are, are designed, you know, not solely for what the consumer is, you know, consumer, you know, wants, but also what interacts with, with the recycling stream. So over the last few years, 
you know, we have gotten much more closer to our recycle, you know, our recyclers to understand how certain packaging actually interacts with uh, with the recycling stream. That's not just the commodities we choose for base packaging, but also labels, adhesives, and, and things like that. So at this point, you know, we're we're proud as an organization to be putting out products that are 100%, you know, recyclable and universally accepted. Um, from you know primarily through PET, HDPE, and also some some aluminum as well. You know the third bucket, of course, is improving that consumer education. That's label iconography, messages to our consumers. You know how to recycle labels and and things like that. There's more work to be done there, but it's an absolutely crucial thing that you know CPG companies like us are are, are, are talking to our consumers and also making the case. Um, you know, for recycling. The last piece, which I think we're going to be spending the most part today, is, you know, investing in collection as well as material and delivery innovations. So when we talk about material innovation, we're primarily going to be talking today, at least I'm going to be talking today about recycled content, recycled PEP, post-consumer recycled resins. But of course, it's, it's also important to know delivery innovations, that there's some opportunities to move away from you know, the single serving packages to the refillable, reusable options, you know, larger formats and things like that. But getting back to material innovations, the big focus of, of our organization is transitioning to circularity with the beverage container. And of course, for us, that means um, increasing the amount of post-consumer recycled content, our pet, in our containers. We have a, a, a commitment and a goal of an organization of reaching 25% recycled content across our portfolio by the end of this year, and then 50% by, by 2030. Um, we're at 20% we reported at the, at the, end, of, uh, at the end of 2020. Um, we're making great progress, but there is, of course, more to go. You know, as I travel around the country now virtually and having these discussions, I think that the two areas that I talk about, and I think we can we can kind of go in a little bit deeper today, is the importance for both demand side policy interventions and supply side policy interventions. And, and James kind of alluded to that earlier as well. From a demand side policy intervention, you know, we're talking a lot about post-consumer recycled content standards and mandates. We need to make sure that our, our reclaimers and our recyclers have a consistent customer for their materials that doesn't ebb and flow upon the cost of natural gas and oil, right? Um, I, I, I commonly say that the, the, the post-consumer recycled content standards are the renewable portfolio standard for the beverage container. Likewise, we need smart supply side policy intervention, and Elizabeth alluded to that in her presentation, where we're so focused on how do you make sure that you know, our recyclers and our reclaimers have the feedstock they need because too, too many bottles are not being collected and they're you know, focusing on smart deposit return systems, um, and which, is, which is something that I'm happy to get into uh, in the panel discussion, Elizabeth. Thank you, great to be with you. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, and last, but certainly not least, we have Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner of Recycling and Sustainability at the Department of Sanitation for New York City. Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, good to see you. Uh, we are former colleagues in New York City, so it's always great to, to, to chat. Um, so my, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to just give a, a grounding in, in New York City, uh, given that this is uh, Circular City Week New York. Um, and and some many of the issues that we face are ones of scale and density. It's not unique in the world. It's certainly unique um, in, in New York City. Um, one in 38 people living in the US live in New York City. Um, we have more people in this city than 40 of the 50 states. 1.1 um, million school children are being served meals every single day and have packaging uh, that they're discarding uh, and food waste uh, in schools. Um, our density is about 27,000 people per square mile. And I think some of the most important things about thinking about the logistics of uh, innovation related to managing our waste sustainably is more than 80% of New Yorkers live in multi-unit housing and two thirds of those are renters. So in, when we're talking about individual behavior change, we have to think about what are the mechanisms and levers that you can actually use in a renter multi-unit 
environment. Um, and then again, half of the waste that is produced in New York City, more than half, is from businesses and institutions. Um, next slide. I think the next, yeah, the next slide is just a basics about the Department of Sanitation. So I'm Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability um, for a municipal agency. It's a uniformed workforce and we don't just collect waste, trash and recycling. We also, uh, those white trucks uh, put plows on the front, we plow the snow. Um, we had a very uh, snowy February. So what happens is that 10,800 tons of garbage and 2,700 tons of recyclables. If it's a snow day, we're out plowing and, and, and that pile um, only grows. And so we're constantly chasing, the weather is critical when thinking about how we're managing material seasonality of the infrastructure and the processes that we're trying to come up with, especially when we're thinking about infrastructure for reusables. Um, so we're constantly thinking about um, on a very pragmatic, practical level, you know, similar to Kate, I think I'm one of the sort of on the ground pragmatic voices um, that can certainly weigh in today. Um, we also clean streets and litter um, and we manage uh, transfer stations, compost and recycling facilities, and then we regulate the public, the commercial sector waste. Next slide. Uh, and then I would say right now, the, the real focus for New York City's sustainability um, related to waste management is our, um, our climate goals. Um, New York City has um, aligned itself with the Paris Climate Agreement and has very aggressive climate goals for 2050, carbon neutrality, infrastructure resiliency, and climate accountability and justice. And I think the justice and the inclusiveness of the solutions is something that we're really trying to bring to the forefront in, in what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> the one NYC plan, which is the city's sustainability and equity resiliency plan, um, does have a component about sustainable transportation. And so commercial waste um, in part is tackled through reducing the trucks on the road, electrifying our fleet and finding ways to, um, to manage our waste more efficiently from a, from a logistics standpoint. And then zero waste strategies um, are also in there. So maximizing diversion of traditional recyclables, textiles, other products, mandatory diversion of organic waste. Um, and waste reduction is, is a critical part of that. We wanna shrink the pie as well as divert the pie. Next slide. So just very quickly, cause I know we'll, we were speaking about beverage containers. Uh, New York state is a bottle bill state since 1982. Uh, five cent um, deposit um, on the containers that are covered. Uh, in 2020, the estimate from our state regulators uh, is 5.5 billion plastic, glass, and aluminum beverage containers were collected through the bottle bill system statewide. That's about 240,000 uh, tons of material. Um, enforcement was relaxed due to COVID-19, but it did resume in, in June. Um, and there are proposals expand the bottle bill, um, they haven't passed yet. We do expect that um, some of these will be reintroduced and we can talk about uh, you know, the, the push and pull of deposit container systems and their benefits and, um, and operating and, and managing the viability of curbside programs in this conversation. What is uh, at the state level right now, it's introduced and in the budget um, is EPR for packaging. And so this is something I'm happy to also discuss is you know, what is the role for EPR for packaging um, as it relates to the positive container systems and how can they work potentially uh, complement in a complementary way. Um, and so th the current bills exclude bottle bill items, uh, but include all other be beverage containers. In New York City, you know, our tactic has been mandatory recycling since 1989. Um, so all beverage containers in both residential and commercial sectors, you are required to recycle those materials. Uh, Non-redeemed bottle bill items is part of that. Um, sadly, of those non-redeemed bottle bill items, only 40% gets captured in, in our recycling bins, as, as was alluded to earlier, their capture rates are fairly low. Um, and the glass, that is the glass containers, beverage containers that are collected and managed at the MRF, largely go to recycled glass aggregate. They're not back to bottle. We have not solved for that yet. And, and generally in terms of transparency of understanding, we have a very good understanding of the residential sector. The commercial sector achievements are largely unknown to government. So to the extent that there's backhauling um, back to distribution centers of bottles and containers, 
we really don't have the data to be able to do good planning for um, you know, any policy intervention. So that's just a, a hole that we have that we would love to solve for. And then lastly, we are very interested in piloting projects for reuse. And so we've had a number of uh, conversations, we're involved in a number of workshops, there's some grant money. And um, you know, every single time you look at this, it's logistics, 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 it's infrastructure, it's storage. And so we have to solve those on the ground um, issues through pilots to figure out what's possible. So we're excited to continue to, to, to work on this. Um, and then last slide. Um, and this is just a little stats to, to for information. If you look at our residential waste profile, almost 50% of the discards um, are packaging and paper. And of that packaging and paper, you know, most bottle bill material gets redeemed, but 3.6% of material that does end up either in the trash or in the recycling that are picked up by our trucks is, is bottle bill material. And that glass 6.6% is um, is largely um, glass aggregate uh, that is broken up, mixed colored. Um, so glass bottles that are no longer bottles, uh, it, which means that the, the challenge of, of bringing that back to a bottle system um, is there. So I'll leave it there so we can have plenty of time for conversation, but excited to join this conversation today. Thank you, Bridget, and thanks um, everyone. I, you know, one thing that strikes me is, um, at least from a sort of reloop perspective, um, we really feel strongly about engaging different stakeholder groups. And, and even just today, we have, you know, we have a MRF uh, rep, we have a, a city operator, um, you know, we have a producer, and obviously we've got um, some really capable um, technical analysis from, from capabilities from metabolic. So, you know, I feel like we've got a supply chain, a really nice snapshot of the of the value chain here. Um, and with that, maybe what I'll do is just pose a question to all of you. Um, you know, one thing that often is missing is conversations from upstream to downstream about how to design for circularity, how to design for recyclability. And then likewise, um, you know, this conversation between MRFs and cities um, about what the challenges are, um, what are the real numbers in terms of not just what's collected and dropped off at a MRF, um, but what's actually getting um, put back into the market as a secondary in the secondary market um, and getting recycled versus downgraded. Um, and then on the on the producer end and and um, and the recycling end, you know, what is feasible in terms of recycle content? We learned from Metabolic's report that, you know, aluminum can get up to 90%. Um, our pet is not, is not, it's more challenging. Um, so maybe what I'll do is just say, you know, ask anyone who wants to kick us off, um, what are some of the complexities that you feel we face in, in sort of reaching or moving towards a circular packaging um, sector in the US. And um, we talked a little bit about the market economics, but, um, and more importantly, kind of how do you, what do you see as, as opportunities and solutions to tackle some of those barriers? I can kick us off. That's a pretty loaded question. Um, <laughs> so I'll just say from a MERV perspective, we get phone calls all day long and people are like have some bottle in their hand and they're like, is this recyclable? And they want it to be recyclable. And when we say no, they get mad. They're like, don't you talk to the packagers and tell them that it should be? And we're like, no, like, you know, so for decades, we have not talked to the packagers, but really excited to see, I'd say in the last two years, a really concerted effort to have this cross supply chain conversation conversation and that's huge. So now we have opportunities to work with with businesses of all types and sizes to say, hey, don't use that label, make it out of this material instead. You know, we do some consumer feedback, we do test runs through the MRF. Um, that sort of input is huge because right now we are very reactive as an industry. I mean there's tons and tons of packaging design and innovation. We are a really slow capital intensive bunch of sorting facilities, you know, and so we need to be part of that conversation. When we're looking to make investments, we need to know where packaging is going first um, and be able to give our input on that. And then as Peter said, we need places to be able to sell that. We need to be able to sell it consistently at enough value to cover our costs. And so a lot of those conversations that I have with packaging designers, they're really focused on how do I get it recycled? 
And I like to flip the question and how do I add more recycled content as the first part of that question? Like, how do I really drive the demand for recycling? That's something that with, with every package we have today, we could add more recycled content, even though some, you know, we can't recycle everything like flexible films and things like that. So really excited to have this sort of cross collaboration conversation, U.S. Plastics Pact is another space where we're engaged across the value chain. And, you know, that's going to help drive those larger policy changes that are going to be need, needed to bring everybody on board. You know, what strikes me about the time that we're living in, and I couldn't agree more with, with, with what Kate's saying, is that there's more conversation now than I think that's ever that's ever uh, occurred in this space, informal and formal, right? I think that, that all of us are involved in a lot of formal dialogues, whether it's, you know, the Ocean Plastics Leadership Network and what they're doing with the Global uh, Plastics Treaty work, we're all these informal conversations. And I think some of the most important informal conversations that we've had as a brand are with people like Kate, right? I think rather than just saying, like I said, what, what, what does the consumer want? It's how does this packaging that we want to produce perform in your system and how can we make it better? And with that kind of design for recyclability at the front end, it allows us to have more confidence that the packaging that we're putting into the system, once it's recycled, has a higher degree of probability of us being able to use it to put it back into another bottle for that, that circular economy. So I think it's I think it's I think it's great. I think we need I think we need to have more kind of safe spaces to have these conversations. I think that's happening. I think um, you know, five, 10 years ago, these conversations were happening solely before you know, legislative public hearings in an advocacy standpoint. And uh, while that's certainly still happening, I'm seeing also you know, these, you know, the, these relationships being built you know, across the supply chain that I think um, are, are just are yielding incredible amount of learnings uh, for everybody. I'll take you back on that one second. Um... I completely agree that I think there's just more knowledge and understanding out in the open around what the obstacles are in the way of achieving the circular future that we all want. Um, and I think the analysis that we've done, the, the work that's out there in terms of setting best practices for packaging design, aligning it with the recycling pathways that are available, I think just connecting those dots has been a huge step in that direction of having really open and honest conversations about what needs to be done to move forward. And I do think it also sparks this, um, this idea of innovation and, and really what do we need to innovate on and, and rethinking how packaging is delivered to consumers and how consumers are part of the story of keeping materials in circulation. Of course, it's not all on consumers to, to do their job, but it's part of the entire system that needs to operate um, in order for us to achieve circularity. Yeah, and I, I so agree with, we need to have demand drive drive the system because if we're if you know if Kate in, in Boulder and Sims in New York City if we're collecting material just to collect it that's a really expensive trip to a landfill and and a really inefficient one so we need demand because demand will drive the desire and the actions to get more supply and I think one thing I would just add to the you know Elizabeth your question about challenges is recycling is a leaky system Know, and if we're trying to think about reusables, that is going to be a leaky system. We have to solve for how do we reduce the leakiness. So I, I talk about in New York City in the context of we have a 50, we've had 30 plus years of a mandatory recycling program. We only capture 50% of recyclables still today, you know, and a lot of this is about the built environment and designing not only the products to be reclaimable, but to design our spaces so that we are able to more easily and effectively capture it. We have to meet people where they're at. Convenience, to go, people are on a to-go lifestyle. You know, yes, we're all home during COVID, but um, when it opens up, you know, not everyone's gonna bring a backpack full of reusables from home, depending on if they happen to decide they want a cup of coffee or if they happen to want a cup of soup, right? So, or a salad. So we have to figure out a way to design the system so that we're capturing this material and circulating it back, whether it's in reuse or whether it's in recycling. And so, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of in financial investment in infrastructure related to energy retrofits and buildings and the built environment. We need those types of 
subsidies and and energy and financial investments in the built environment related to like efficient waste management and convenience uh, for for individuals. And and we need and and frankly, we're at the point now where we need to help enable the voluntary desire to have recycled content with legislation that mandates it so that we can drive that supply to the demand. Thanks, Bridget. Um, and thanks, everyone, for those insights. Um, I really liked what you said, Bridget, at the end um, about uh, the sort of signals to market to invest um, and, and sort of the, the role of intervention um, as being a driver. And I guess maybe my question to you and to all the panelists um, is what do you see as the necessary pathway uh, to circularity and packaging, um, both in terms of innovation, um, capital investments that Bridget spoke about, but also um, you know, effective policy intervention um, and other mechanisms. Um, maybe it's contracting. You know, I, I, I hear from MRFs too that, uh, or glass recyclers that you know, if, if we could just get into a contract, right? If we could be sure that we get the glass we need at the specs we need, um, you know, that, that's all we need. So contracting is another mechanism, but I'm really curious to hear from, from you all um, what you see as the, as the necessary pathway. I mean, I think from a policy perspective, it's mandatory recycled content, but doing that in a smart way, thinking through it's not just one number for every material, for every product, you know, how do you, and how do you create a stepped approach that you're actually making real gains and not, not um, fake gains in that process. Um, I think there's also um, a value for, um, sorry, I just totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> Um, so I think, I think that the COVID brain there, I know, <laughs> <laughs> completely and toddler brain. Uh, so I, I think the, um, the idea, like I said, of, of there needs to be some level of financial investment in closing, closing the leakiness. And, and so there are existing systems that we want to optimize. We want to work better. And, you know, there's been a little bit in the Q and A about, single stream versus dual stream. New York City happens to be a dual stream program, which is, you know, our paper is separate, which is, which really helps the process, but we still, there's a, still a lot of material in, um, in our MGP, our metal glass plastic, that is, um, it's, for, it's foreign to recycling and there's no place for recycling. And the wish cycling that Kate mentions is, is real. Um, and so we have to solve for that. So investment in, especially I think about for glass, investment in, um, if glass, if, if the highest and best use, and this is where we need to talk to industry, is to get glass back as bottles and not as cullet, then we got to talk about what's the best path for that. It, that's the bottle bill. If it's, if it's glass cullet, but it needs to be color sorted, then it's investment in the MRFs and the secondary recovery facilities to actually adequately sort it. Um, you know, and, and then also the design so that if, if it's clear glass that everyone wants in the recycled content, then we got to be producing clear glass and not green glass. So um, I guess it sort of depends a little bit on it. And this is why the conversation across the supply chain is so important. Yeah, I think Bridget made a really good point. I think historically, when we looked at the end market for, for post-consumer recycled content, saw a lot of um, end users not executing kind of long-term supply contracts for that material, buying it either on spot or, or, in, or these very short-term contracts. And a lot of that was, you know, kind of the, the push and pull between the cost of virgin and the cost of, uh, of post-consumer recycled content and the delta there. Um, I think the, the important thing that post-consumer recycled content standards do, does is it, it, it mandates that demand so that these end markets will go and execute these longer term supply contracts with our recycling community so that you know, the recyclers can then go to the capital markets and get the financing that they need to support longer -term investments in their own capacity infrastructure and machinery and equipment, which you know they they, they really haven't been able to do. Um, I think you know I think that uh, when we're talking about the demand side policy intervention, I haven't heard anyone kind of bring forth a better idea than that. So I'll jump in and say totally agree with Peter and Bridget that demand side is huge and recycled content standards are one of the three big policy uh, changes we'd like to see. Uh, the three being uh, recycled content standards, deposit research systems, and then I'll speak a little bit to extended producer responsibility. We have an interesting situation 
situation in Colorado where we have two glass manufacturers. We have Rocky Mountain Bottling Company, we have Owens, Illinois, and yet we don't source enough glass here in the state. We don't have enough curbside recycling programs. We don't have cities investing in curbside. So we're trucking in glass from Michigan, which is the nearest bottle bill state, uh, to feed those glass. So, so the demand itself is not, is not strong enough. I think we also need to look at the supply side. Um, so when I look at how are we going to roll out uh, better supply side, better curbside, I mean, we need curbside recycling, right, in all of our urban areas. When I live in an area of the country where we do not have it, local governments have not been involved in recycling. We have a 16% recycling rate here in Colorado. It's embarrassing. Um, so that investment also has to come um, from the producers. There has to be a role there. And the cost of recycling has to be embedded into the cost of the product. It can't just be something that we pay in addition, so really looking at having those conversations about what does producer responsibility look like? How do we transition out of the current system and how do we match up bringing in more supply and creating more demand because we really need both. I'll add one additional layer here um, and just thinking about how we can link, you know, climate goals and, and job creation and all these other benefits that come with in investing in the infrastructure that we need for these circular interventions that we're mentioning. You know, it's not just an investment without benefits. We have to think about what the benefits are and clearly link them to our climate goals. Um, and I do see also, you know, adding value to these packages as, as uh, something that can incentivize um, um, the, the collection. And one quote that I love from this Canners in New York documentary, which we had thought about playing a clip of, but there's, you know, someone mentioning how there's gold on the streets, you know, there's, there's gold, there's actual value in creating jobs around, around collection and, and depositing uh, the, the, the bottles and the cans. Um, so thinking about the, both the economics um, from, a, from a purely economic form, but also the other added benefits that come from the, the in, uh, investments as well. Great, thanks. Um, so we're almost at time and I'm trying to, there's a lot of questions I'm looking at in the Q&A and trying to see what we can get to. Um, I might just really quickly ask one uh, before uh, pulling in some of the audience questions and we can keep uh, having this conversation for, for participants who are able to stay on. Um, but one thing I have heard um, all the panelists talk about is this sort of tension between recyclability um, and, and recycle content as a, as a driver to maximize recyclability um, and source reduction, right? And so transitioning to refill and reuse being a more of an effective driver um, at source reduction. So I guess one thing that um, I'd love to hear you all share um, is, you know, and, and seeing this as a sort of deeper issue at play um, and, and thinking about the waste hierarchy and moving up um, the, the waste hierarchy towards most beneficial, environmentally beneficial um, use. Um, so what are some things that you see as opportunities to incentivize source reduction? Um, and if you see any interplay between um, the systems for recycling and the systems for um, reuse and refillables, I think that would be, um, you know, especially interesting to hear. And maybe I'll kick it over to James to lead us since he, he went uh, last last time. Sure, happy to discuss a bit about this. I really do see, you know, the rethinking and um, the, the new business models around, around packaging as a huge space for us to innovate on and as a huge opportunity for brands to really set themselves apart from the pack as well. Um, there's a lot of really interesting um, pilot projects that are, that are being, uh, being uh, you know, used around the world that I think are, are testaments to the, the appetite that consumers have for this type of innovation as well. Um, of course, we need to have the, uh, the waste collection infrastructure in place. We need to have the logistics operators as part of the conversation, um, as active participants in creating these solutions that, that, um, that, are, that are being explored on a pilot level. And how do we really scale this up is the, is the real question that, that needs to be asked next. And are there things you see in Europe, James, that um, are you know, worth sharing with this audience? I know we've got an international audience here, but um, certainly I think a lot, of, a lot of US folks would love to hear sort of some exciting innovations um, on your side of the pond. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's quite a bit of, of movement happening. Um, I think 
one of the standards is, of course, we have uh, many you know, deposit systems that are just super, super easily accessible at your local, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Albert Hein is, is the one that we have here in, in Amsterdam. Um, but then again, the source separation is, is just a really, um, um, you know, clearly marked um, and very accessible um, uh, infrastructure in place. Um, we're also seeing some interesting innovation in terms of um, more ephemeral packaging, for example, packaging that um, that will, you know, is either edible or completely biodegradable that that you rethink how the packaging is used and, and how the product interacts with the packaging it, itself, of course. Um, I can think of a few additional question, <laughs> examples as we uh, as we uh, pass it on to someone else, but I yeah, definitely um, quite a bit of interesting space in the bio based packaging as well. But connecting it to the, the right infrastructure to recover that and make sure that it fits within um, uh, the right sourcing as well of, of bio-based materials. So I'll chime in on that uh, innovation. I'll drop a link in the chat, but Ellen MacArthur Foundation has been doing some great work in this space and they have a great database of all these different product innovations, you know, rethinking, reuse, refill, getting rid of packaging altogether. It's really inspiring. Um, and I think that's such a great question. It's not, you know, is aluminum, glass or plastic better? It's how do we just get rid of the bottle altogether? Um, and, and see that happening, a couple of things I want to just mention. First, it has to, we have to have targets, we have to have goals. So we're starting to see some goals being talked around, uh, food service packaging, some, of our, some um, you know, reduction goals in that space. So you know, we had recycling goals forever, we need to start building in the, the waste reduction goals as part of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was e-commerce, right, has just radically changed our lives. And this whole concept of convenience and I'm having to take a bottle somewhere and have, like, they come to my door now, right? So how can they also take the same material away? So we're really excited to see Loop, um, the online platform, kind of reinventing the milkman model where your packaging is coming in reusable stainless steel containers. I mean, that is so kudos to all the major brands. Like that is an investment in trying to make reuse work. And I think we're on the verge of really tapping into that e-commerce revolution and trying to figure out, you know, how do we use that as a back and forth and not just a one way anymore. So I think setting those targets, using that innovation. And then I would also point to government procurement. I mean, I think, you know, we have huge buying dollars with our government as well as our universities. Um, and that's somewhere where we can really create that market demand, create that security for those types of innovations to, to flourish and then scale. Yeah, we'll I that think, not oh, only Not only packaging um, innovation within e-commerce, but also we see packaging free uh, supermarkets popping up as well. So rethinking how, how your um, infrastructure needs to, to, to deliver products to a consumer in a variety of different pathways. I think we need to consider them all. I, I agree, and I, and I think, and play a little devil's advocate, we also have to meet people where they're at. If you don't have a car and you don't have a way to bring all your containers with you, we have to solve for that too, um, which is just part of the fun of this complicated topic. Um, one of the things I would say is we also need to make sure that whatever the reusable packaging is that we are designing has a limited lifespan, and so we need to make sure that those are also designed for recyclability. Um, that we're, you know, we're thinking about the replication, re reclamation, if it is aluminum, um, you know, shampoo bottles, that it's aluminum shampoo bottles, bottles that are actually reclaimable once they're at their, they, they've spent, you know, they're at the end of their lives. Um, and I think with e-commerce, the, you know, the massive, massive distribution hubs and investments that are going into distributing goods, we need to leverage that infrastructure and that investment to then think about how do we then manage the taking back of, of reusable, whether it's, you know, the, whatever the alternative for the cardboard box is going to be. Um, we, we do have to think about infrastructure space, warehousing, storage, transport, lo logistics is just so critical path, I think, to, to doing that. And I think part of, it, part of the ability to do that is, again, to find ways for government to, like, innovative, creative strategies for government to um, whether it's direct subsidy or whether it's some sort of in-kind tax break or whatever it is to um, spur that investment. I also think, uh, frankly, fr uh, competition is good. Like we want, we want an Apple and an Android competing with each other to win in this space because that's where we're going to see it's going to be an evolution 
and we're going to see different, you know, we already have piloting of different, um, you know, vending machine systems where you can refill your, you know, your, your, um, you know, laundry detergent and things like that in little ways, you know, but someone's going to, I think competition is, is one of the ways that we can help to solve for that. And so what makes it worth a company's while to get to compete for this? You know, we have to, I think that's a really important part too. And I hope that experts like, uh, like James and others can help us come up with what those creative, you know, government mechanisms are. And okay, so a really, and I, I don't want to cut you off, Pete, but um, you feel free to chime in. But um, a really interesting question, I think, that comes in from um, Fiona Anastas, which is, um, what do you all think about a deposit on every material or packaging um, so that everything has a value? Will that increase reclamation rate? Who's brave enough to take this on? So I guess from a practical standpoint, and I think Kate's point earlier is we need curbside programs. And so it would be great to figure out how do we solve for the mesh in like the enmeshing of deposit system to incentivize like getting reducing the leaky system into curbside programs, because I think some material is worthwhile to have it take back redemption center system because we want that bottle to still be a bottle or whatever it is. Other items. Um, there, there isn't frankly a strong of a market. And so we first have to figure out who's, who's the buyer and what condition does that material need to be in for the buyer to want it on a regular basis. And so, um, you know, in New York City, we rely, you know, I frankly think we need to improve upon the conditions under which, you know, canners are exercising their right to earn income. Um, and, and, you know, the reason why the re redemption rates of glass bottles are lower is because they're heavier, you know, they, they cherry pick the, the, the pet and the HDBE. And so I think we have to think about what are the, um, yeah, what, 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 how does a deposit system on a pouch work if there, if there's no market for it at the other end, you know, then we're just having the, the distributor collect it for disposal, I guess that there's a point to be made there. Um, so anyway, I'll let other people speak to you. <laughs> so I think the yeah, question can be also, maybe the question can be as broad as what do you think about bottle bills for any packaging? Maybe we can, uh, you know, put aside that all packaging is a, is a realm of possibility, but just even to weigh in on sort of your views on, um, on, you know, container deposits or deposit system for containers and other sort of more proven viable um, packaging. I think Fiona, Fiona is absolutely asking the right question. Like, what is the incentive for the consumer to participate? Because as Peter said earlier, we can build the best recycling system, we can create the markets, and at the end of the day, we are relying on the consumer to put it in the bin, bring it back to the store. So if it's not a bottle deposit, it has to be something. We can't just rely on education as a way to ensure that people um, have recycling. You know, first they have to have access, but second, we need to drive it. And I don't think we talk enough about, um, you know, bottle deposits are, are great for driving participation, but yeah, they may not apply to other materials. So the materials they don't apply to, what's, what's the carrot? What is the consumer actually getting out of this for participating? Because it is, um, we need to make it as convenient and simple as possible, but we also need to figure out what's how you really drive that participation that we need. Any other thoughts um, for the panelists? All right, well, I think we should um, probably wrap up. Um, there's been so much good to share here and there, I know we could go on and on. Um, and it, you know, it, 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 we have talked about recycled content. We have talked about EPR, um, just in terms of if anyone is interested, Reloop will be um, involved in webinars on both topics in the next, um, in the coming weeks. So I shared that information um, via Q and A if anyone is interested. Um, maybe a final question um, to you all, which is, um, you know, what is your, uh, if we're going to see urgent change, what should we all be thinking about and doing right now? Um, so what is your kind of ask of the audience or um, you know, sort of a now solution that you feel we can all uh, take away and act upon? 
You know, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's there's a, there's a few that I'd say. I mean, one of them that that I think is is actionable right now by all of us is you know when we're making those consumption you know decisions, whether at the grocery store or wherever we're we're purchasing products, to um, to the extent that we're able to make those dis make those purchasing decisions for those brands, those products that are embracing circularity, right? I mean, I think one of the challenges that many of us have is that putting a product that is, a, you know, 100% recycled content in the market adds, right now adds cost vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a competitive product that's, that's made of 100% virgin material. And so I think one of the things that we're trying to do as a consumer is, I mean, as a, as a company is to, you know, make that case to consumers that buying circular, you know, buying products that embrace circularity, um, you know, is, is an important, responsible, you know, consumer decision. Yeah, I'll say for everyone listening in, you know, regardless of where you are in the production use recycling chain, everyone has something they can contribute to the conversation um, and recognizing what your role is in that and taking ownership of that and advocating for these policies that are going to be transformative in the coming years that we really need to embrace and to move forward. Um, I do think that there's a lot of conversation and um, education that needs to happen on, of course, the embodied impact of these materials and how to retain that embodied impact uh, um, over multiple life cycles. Um, you know, there's an interesting uh, point raised in, in the chat, of course, of know what is the you know the role of, of subsidies on, on virgin material of, of plastics for example and how do you compete with that and, and that's a question that I think is important to add to the discussion um, it's 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 you know the how do we price the externalities of the production systems that we have and consider that as part of a, a larger system so not to sort of throw a, a additional question into the ring but I'm you know there's a lot of larger systems but um, at play that we need to be considering in our in our everyday sort of packaging decisions and how does it connect as well to the um, you know the use of that product and making sure that the packaging is really fitting in with the the use um, thinking about you know, food waste reduction and and the connection between packaging there as well there's a lot of sort of trade-offs in any sort of um, solution and and just coming at it from a from a educated and a, a wide uh, perspective and asking really deep questions I think is the the key um, to coming up with a transformative and innovative solution that works for everybody. I would say that um, right now, immediately, there are many, many um, active bills being proposed in state government. And <clears throat> what we need to do is really work to advance. There are some game changer types of schemas that are being discussed. So recycled content has been out there. We haven't figured out the best way to apply recycled content requirements, but we want it, we want to keep improving upon that. We have, I believe, is it 11 states at this point that have EPR for packaging bills. A um, lot of discussion about bottle bill and potentially expanding and adjusting those. I think there are ways that you can I, immediately pay attention to the bills that are being introduced, and we have to get some of these bills passed so we can have our learning curve. Some of them may not be perfect, but the fact that we are mandated to do something forces action and then we see okay this worked well this didn't work so well and then we need to you know adjust but we, we have to get some of these bills passed so we can actually get some new mechanisms in action okay, i'll echo what, yeah i'll echo what bridget said we're states trying to move forward with uh epr and so you know that that really is a fundamental game changer so get involved with that policy but i want to step back and think about what brought us to this moment right recycling has had some challenges we've wanted to move first to a circular economy for a long time why do we all of a sudden have uh, more of an urgent pace and to me it comes down to two things it's plastics in the ocean right people are mad people are mad about plastics in our environment it's health impact and they have spoken up um, you know, so we are seeing companies come to the table, we're seeing the supply chain come together because of this public outcry about plastics in the oceans. The fact that we've used our voice to say this is not okay, we are helping to drive that larger change in the system. So we need to continue to use that voice to say, you know, this is what we want, what we have now is not okay, we have to do better. Um, and, and similarly on that vein, we have a climate crisis happening. And this conversation about circular cities in New York can't be different than the conversation happening on Climate Week in New York. Like 
this is a huge part of addressing the climate crisis as well. And too often we think of waste and recycling as this silo over here and climate being about transportation and power plants over here. And, you know, it is one in the same solution. So I think also um, I see far too many climate action plans that that hardly mention the benefits of recycling or reuse or composting. I think really breaking down those silos is absolutely huge work for all of us to do. Great, thanks for, for everyone's final uh, closing remarks. Um, and I think I'll just dovetail with what Kate said. Um, we know that ocean pollution is a huge issue. Um, even just looking at um, beach litter uh, as, um, documented by the Ocean Conservancy database uh, finds that, um, you know, when you do the math on, on beverage containers, um, it's 80% of beach litter um, by weight and by volume. So, you know, even just focusing in on the, on the, on the bottle, um, the beverage container opportunity, um, we're not looking at a small part of the pie, but really um, a big, a big piece of it and a potential for impact. Um, and the other thing, you know, I heard, I think we some really interesting points about um, the consumer role and making this a default option for consumers, um, convenient, um, equitable, accessible. Um, and just saying, you know, with just to say, finally, um, I think as we think about the transition to circular packaging and a circular economy, um, figuring out these tools that are effective transitional mechanisms. So perhaps we don't want to see um, a bottle bill, you know, that just keeps, you know, churning out more and more uh, single use packaging, even if it's being recycled, you know, and we're, we want to be moving towards reuse or to reuse and, and source reduction. Um, and one of the things I think that's really effective about, about uh, bottle bill systems is it's the same infrastructure. So whether you're putting in a bottle um, to be recycled or to be refilled, you know, you're, you're able to use that infrastructure and that capital build out um, to really kind of transition to more of a uh, beyond circularity to, to source reduction. Um, so there's a lot more to unpack, um, but I think we'll leave it there. I'm going to turn the floor back to Jordan. I want to say thank you again uh, to the brilliant panelists uh, and the organizers for uh, a completely dynamic um, and thrilling conversation. So thank you all. Thanks, uh, Elizabeth. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad that somebody mentioned the, the, uh, the oceans. It was actually my in my previous job, I was dealing with the Arctic and with Antarctica and with the world's oceans. And uh, a, a scientist from the University of Utrecht uh, calculated that um, if a plastic bag is thrown in the River Thames in London, it has a 60% chance of ending up in the Arctic uh, because of ocean currents, etc. So there's plastics being found there that are 40, 50 years old already, and the animals are affected by it, of course. So um, that, that's a bad statistic. Anyway, um, thanks, Elizabeth, for, for moderating this, this session. Uh, a big thanks to all the panelists for their great uh, interventions and great presentations. Uh, very interesting. And as I said at the beginning, I have learned a lot. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Metabolic, for being the driving force behind this webinar. And then, of course, a big thank you to the audience um, for joining us. Uh, I'd just like to say there is a big circular event coming up on April 15th. Um, I will just put that right there in the, uh, which is the World Circular uh, Economy Forum, April 15th. It's hosted by the Netherlands together with Finland and Canada, bringing together governments, industry and NGOs, et cetera, to talk about a circular economy. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, please reach out to the panels to the panelists directly or through a metabolic or contact us at the consulate in new york and we will uh, we will help you further thank you so much for joining and have a great day everybody.